Hello, I'm glad to be with you this morning and we want to welcome everybody that's tuning in. Uh, my name's Dan Perschel. I'm the head elder here at the Wenatchee Church and going to be bringing the message today. Not something I do very often, but we're giving the pastor a break and so we're going to, uh, we're going to give it a try. So let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll continue with the message. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your love and grace. We want to thank you that you've promised to be with us as we open the word together. I pray for your spirit that it'll give me words, give me confidence, and give me a, a good uh, presentation of this message. Be with the listeners, help it to be a blessing with them. And thank you again for being with us today as we pray in your holy name. Amen. Grace. The voice stood defiantly. Go ahead, give it to me. The principal looked at the young rebel and asked, How many times have you been here? The child sneered rebelliously. Apparently not enough. And you have been punished each time, the principal responded. Yeah, I've been punished, if that's what you want to call it. Go ahead, I can take whatever you dish out. I always have. And no thought of your punishment enters your head the next time you decide to break the rules? Nope, I do whatever I want to do. Ain't nothing you people going to do to stop me either. The principal looked at the teacher who stood nearby. What did he do this time? Fighting. He shoved Tommy's face into the sandbox. The principal looked at the boy. What did Tommy do to you? Nothing. I didn't like the way he was looking at me. The teacher stiffened, but a quick look from the principal stopped him as he quietly said, Today is the day you learn about grace. Grace, isn't that what you old people do before you sit down to eat? I don't need none of your stinking grace. Oh, but you do, said the principal. The principal studied the young man's face and whispered, Oh yes, you truly do. The boy continued to glare as the principal continued. Grace in its short definition, is unmerited favor. You can't earn it. It's a gift and is always freely given. It means that you will not be getting what you so richly deserve. The boy looked puzzled. You're not going to whoop me? You're just going to let me walk? The boy studied the face of the principal. No punishment at all, even though I socked Tommy and shoved his face into the sandbox? Oh, there has to be punishment. What you did was wrong, and there's always consequences to our actions. There will be punishment. Grace is not an excuse for doing wrong. I knew it, sneered the boy as he held out his hands. Let's get on with it. The principal nodded toward the teacher. Bring me the belt. The teacher presented the belt to the principal. He carefully folded it in two and then handed it back to the teacher. The principal looked at the child and said, I want you to count the blows. The principal walked over to stand directly in front of the young man. He gently reached out, folded the child's outstretched, expected hands together, and then turned to face the teacher with his own hands outstretched. One quiet word came from his mouth, begin. The belt whipped down on the outstretched hands of the principal. Crack. The young man jumped. Shock registered his face. One, he whispered. Crack. Two, his voice raised an octave. Crack. Three. He couldn't believe this. Crack. Four. Big tears welled up in, his, in the eyes of the rebel. Okay, stop, that's enough, stop. 
crack came the belt down on the hands of the principal. Crack, the child flinched with each blow, tears beginning to stream down his face. Crack, crack. No, please, the former rebel, uh, rebel begged. Stop it. I did it. I'm the one who deserved it. Stop, please stop. Still the blows came, crack, crack, one after the other. Finally it was over. The principal stood with sweat glistening across his forehead and beads of sweat trickling down his face. Slowly he knelt down, studied the young man for a second, and then his swollen hand reached out to cradle the face of the weeping child and he said, Grace. Our text today is uh, from Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. I want to begin our, our study with this, and I'll read it, as you'll see it on the screen. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It was by his grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Jesus Christ, in order that in coming ages he might show incomparable riches, the incomparable riches of his grace. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, according to the scriptures, I think it's safe to say that we're all in needs of God's grace. Psalms 51.5 states, states that we were born into sin. And Paul in Romans 3, 8, uh, 3, 10 through 18, excuse me, quotes the testament, the Old Testament, that all have sinned and no one is good. Romans 5, 6, and 8 puts our need like this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for, right, for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So why grace? What have we done to deserve it? That's the point of grace. We do absolutely nothing to deserve it. As Ephesians 2.8 puts it, it's the gift of God. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It's a gift. You can only accept the gift that God offers you. Do you owe for the gift once you accept it? Of course not. It's not a loan that you have to pay back. It's a gift. Now, the fact that the gift is free to the recipient doesn't mean it comes without cost to the giver. The gift of salvation costs the sinner nothing, but the price of such an extravagant gift comes at a great cost for our Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place. I like the way 2 Corinthians 8, 9 states the cost. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, though through his poverty, might become rich. Amen to that, huh? I'd like to now impress you with my scholarship, with my deep study into Hebrew and uh, Greek. Just kidding. But while studying about grace, I came across the fact about the differences in the Old and New Testament use of the word. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word used is hen, H-E-N. And the most often translated it is most often translated unmerited, or unmerited favor or finding favor in the eyes of the Lord. 
In the New Testament, the Greek word used is charis. And here we find the idea of grace, but also unmerited favor. In Genesis, we see hand used when Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. And of course, he and his family were saved from the flood in the ark Noah had built. Moses, most notably in uh, Exodus 33, finds favor with God. And they speak to each other as one man speaks to a, another friend. And in this, in this passage that Moses asks to see God face to face, God lets him know he's found favor with him, but he could not see God face to face and live. However, God shows Moses his glory from the backside. In the New Testament, Jesus is never quoted using the word cherished, but there is no question he taught the concept of unmerited favor of God. For example, you see it when he's dealing with the woman caught in adultery. Also in the parable of the Great Supper, where the king sends out his servants to get all who were invited. The, the would-be guests refuse to come and mistreat the servants. So the king sends out more servants to the street, to all the byways and corners, and says, bring whoever you can find to fill the supper, uh, banquet supper hall. However, they must be wearing the robe of righteousness provided by the king. And in that story, one guest is found without the robe and has it to be thrown out. Then there's the parable of the workman in the vineyard. The owner goes out and finds a workman, starts early in the morning, and then at the last few hours of the day, he finds more workmen, and they all get paid the same, no matter if they worked all day or, or just a few hours. In Luke 15, perhaps, is the most compelling of his teachings on unmerited favor. It's the parable of the prodigal son. It's a familiar story. A man had two sons. The younger son comes to the father and says, give me my share of the estate. So the father divides the property between them. Soon after, the younger son leaves with his inheritance to a distant land and proceeds to spend it on wild living. Sometime later, a severe famine strikes this distant country, and the son soon finds himself on hard times, out of money and out of friends, and he takes a job feeding pigs, who seem to be eating better than him because he's starving to death. He comes to his senses, he knows his father's servants at least have plenty to eat. And he decides to go to his father and say, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me one of your hired men. The son starts home. Luke 15, 20 says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son tried to give this carefully prepared spiel he wanted to give, and he got part of it out, but the father wasn't having it. The father tells the servant, bring the best robe, put a, finger on, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. The father proclaims in verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Talk about unmerited favor. Can we even begin to relate as the father? I'm afraid that I, and I'm sure many of us, relate more closely to the other, to the other older son in the story who refuses to join in the celebration. Humanly speaking, it's almost impossible to imagine the father's actions. First of all, running out to meet him, really? While a long way off? I don't think so. I'd make my son uh, 
have to get a servant to go find me somewhere, you know. And cutting off his little speech, no chance. I think he'd have a lot of explaining to do. In full sonship, just like that, I'm thinking maybe at least 10 years of hard work and then maybe we'll talk about it. However, Jesus is talking about his heavenly father and he wants us to know how much our heavenly father loves us, how willing he is to restore us to the family of God. No matter where we've gone or what we've done, no explanation needed, just our confession of our sin and our desire to return to the family. That's it. Just accept his gift of grace and come home. I want to leave you with one last thought or picture in your mind concerning God's grace. When you may be having doubts about your own worth or guilt for, for some past indiscretion, and maybe you just can't imagine God actually loving you, think of that father running out to meet his, that son or daughter while still a long way off in his sandals, robe flowing, and I suspect tears running down his face. And then he embraces you, he kisses you, and tells you how much he loves you. Welcome to God's unmerited love and grace. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, I know it's hard for us to imagine how much that you actually love us, seek us, and want us to return home to you. Give us your spirit that we can make this a reality in our love, in our life, that we can feel this grace and love, and in doing so, share it with others to reflect what you want for their lives also. We pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Okay, I want to thank you for uh, being with us today. And next week, Pastor Joe will be back in his usual spot. So thanks for being with us today.